How did you meet David? Funny story, actually, when David first called me, I didn't know who he was. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't super familiar with bigger pockets. Um, I was a realtor and a, and a loan officer, and I had somebody pre-approved who he was the realtor for. And he just called me and he's like, hey, um, I'm so-and-so's agent. She tells me you're her lender and she tells me that you're good. I'm like, oh, I appreciate that. I look forward to working with you. You know, and he was like, hey, I'm, I'm David Green. I'm like, cool, David Green. I'm Christian. How you doing? <laughs> you know, I had no idea. Obviously, I found out that he's the host of Big Pockets and then I checked it out and then I started listening to it. Um, but then when David was searching for a broker to partner with and loans, my name got thrown into the ring. So it's just it, funny enough, just talking to enough people that, you know, you find yourself in the right room with the right people every now and then. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Succeed REI podcast and YouTube show. My name is Vitaly Volpov. I'm your host. And today I have a very special guest that I'd like to bring on. His name is Christian Bachelor. Christian is a real estate agent in California. He's also a rental property owner investing in short-term rentals all across the United States. He also owns an insurance agency and he's a part owner of a mortgage brokerage with none other than David Green of biggerpockets.com. And Christian has a wealth of knowledge in real estate industry. He's an active and regular contributor on Bigger Pockets. And I have several topics that I want to talk to him about today, specifically the topic involving house hack financing for those looking to buy their first rental property as a house hack. So we're going to do a deep dive on that in just a minute, but I'd like to bring Christian on and introduce him. Christian, how are you doing? Appreciate it. Very good. Thanks for the kind words and uh, looking forward to giving some, uh, some valuable context to all the listeners here. I'm very excited to have you on. Uh, Christian and I talked offline last week and he just blew me out of, out of the water with some of the knowledge that he had on the mortgage products, uh, requirements, constraints, all that stuff. So we're going to get into that in just a minute. But first, Christian, why don't you give a little bit more of a backstory? I know I touched on it a little bit in the intro just now, but maybe talk a little bit about what you do in real estate and how you got into it in the first place. Man, what do I do in real estate? This is probably shorter of what I don't do at this point, huh? <laughs> um, but uh, kind of just like you shared, um, kind of the biggest kind of call to fame, so to speak, is obviously starting the one brokerage with David Green. Um, it's a full service mortgage company. Um, we finance everything from your first home to your 50th home, um, residential, commercial, everything in between. Um, the idea of it was really we wanted to build a, a kind of a one stop like consulting shop, right? A place that you can go to and you can get advice from a realtor. You can get advice from, you know, I, I don't like the term gurus, but, you know, influencers that have made a, made a name for themselves for being um, reputable and, and, you know, based in, you know, good morals and good foundations in their investing strategies. Um, and, you know, we took that and said, Hey, the, the biggest place that there's a lot of misinformation and, you know, improper guidance has given a lot of times is unfortunately the financing portion of it, right? It's, it's the portion that, you know, a lot of times is the most important, you know, it's, 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 how do you make this deal work? How do you run the numbers? How do you make sure that you cash flow or that you're purchasing a successful property? Um, and that was obviously the, uh, the, the, the budding that has created into, uh, that has created one brokerage, right? And on top of that, we've now scaled off to provide insurance services. Um, I've scaled off in my personal investing journey, obviously, as you shared, investing in short-term rentals all over America. Um, I invest primarily, uh, three main markets, Virginia, Florida, and Tennessee, but I review and am knowledgeable with a number of others. Um, but ultimately everything I do, I try to do it in a way that, not as only good for me, obviously, on my own personal pursuits of what I'm trying to accomplish, but I'm trying to go out and make the mistakes and have the successes and the 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 pitfalls and the overcomings and all these things so that I can turn around and provide it as a service to the clients, right? Um, and I, I think David operates a lot of the same principles, and I think that's why Bigger Pockets has grown to be what it is. It's it's just free info, you know, it's stuff that people would yeah. pay thousands of dollars to be enrolled in courses and everything else. And, you know, bigger pockets just sits there and has a bigger, you know, has a podcast, right. Right. Um, has forums. And, and I think it's a, it's an awesome service and it's, it's, it's a really, really cool thing to be involved with. Um, you know, just on the whole scale of bigger pockets as well as David green as a business partner. Yeah. And for me personally, you know, uh, my viewers know I've talked about this before. So I started following and, and I, I signed up on bigger pockets in 2015, where I was still in my, in the early stages of my portfolio building and my own real estate ventures. And it was just like nothing else. You know, I, we talk a lot about, yeah. and this, I think it's gone much farther than this, but 
some of my colleagues in the real estate industry locally here, we've always referred to bigger pockets as the Facebook of real estate, you know, but it has grown significantly since then. Obviously, the podcast itself and all the different resources that Bigger Pockets provides. Um, I check even still now, you know, having 150 rental properties or rental units, I still uh, watch the podcast. I still follow the commentary and uh, the blog posts and all of that. So I think that's that's really, you know, an awesome thing for the real estate industry. And I'm glad that it exists. Absolutely. Um, one thing. One thing I did want to ask you about as you were talking about the different ventures and things you're involved in. So what came first for you? Was it was it rental properties? Was it the brokerage? Was it the insurance agency? What did you get into first? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I it's, it's kind of hard thinking back now, thinking that I didn't do all of this at one point in time because it all just meshes so well together now. Um, but I, I was a real estate agent to start, um, you know, showing houses, trying to talk to as many people as possible, trying to drum up business. And, you know, I realized pretty quickly that for every house that I helped somebody buy, you know, there was usually a lender underperforming, you know, there was usually somebody messing up the deal. There was usually somebody giving bad service. There was, you know, whether that's a lender, an insurance agent, a title officer, uh, you know, all the people that are involved with, with, with making a deal happen. Um, you know, and I thought to myself, like, how hard can it be? Right. Like I, you know, my background, just for those th that may not be familiar, um, I was a chemical engineer by trade. Um, I went to UC Berkeley, graduated in chemical engineering. So, you know, I, 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 without sounding pompous, like I think highly of my mental ability, right? Like I figured, Hey, I'm a realtor. How hard can lending be? It's just numbers. I know numbers, numbers are good. Right. Um, turns out there's a little bit more to it than that. <laughs> um, but you know, start out branching into lending. Um, still didn't own anything myself. Um, I then immediately branched into insurance. I was really big on business building to start, right? I, mm -hmm. I came from a family that wasn't investors, weren't entrepreneurs. Um, you know, kind of fun fact, I was on food stamps for a point in my childhood, right? I mean, mm -hmm. was not, you know, in a financially intelligent family, um, nothing against them. I mean, that's not a hit to my family. That's just, you know, the reality of it. Um, like probably most people, you know, are, are, are raised in this, in this nation, unfortunately with, you know, there's not a finance class that's taught in high school. Why not? <laughs> it just blows my mind. But that's a different, you know, tangent. Um, but as I started doing more and more, you know, I started to realize, oh, now I have, you know, some tax incentives to purchasing real estate. Oh, there's some, you know, preferential treatment that I can get from the IRS by buying properties. Oh, there's some, you know, different ways that I can grow my wealth through real estate. Um, but I kind of made a pact to myself that I didn't want to ever have something that I worked so hard to build take a hit because I was pursuing something personally. And mainly that's rooting in the fact that, you know, I've, I've employed a lot of my friends. Um, you know, my, my college roommate at Berkeley is one of my loan officers, right? My, my high school best friend that I grew up my whole life with is one of my loan officers, right? And these are people that have trusted me enough to believe in my vision, believe in David and mine's partnership, believe in bigger pockets, believe in everything that we're offering. Um, I wouldn't feel right if I went and I started investing personally and kind of casted that off to the side. Um, so I made a pack myself that I would not invest personally until I could invest in the way that I wanted to, which was quickly enough to grow significant wealth and safely enough to never have the business take a negative impact from my investment. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I actually didn't buy my first house until 2020, I want to say, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, for everybody who knows me is probably very shocking, right? I built four or five successful businesses before I bought my first house. Um, but I feel like for me, at least that was done in a way that allowed me to guarantee success every step of the way to make sure I was doing it the right way and right. not, okay, I did this good. Let's move on to this. But now this fails. Right. Yeah. I think that, I mean, it sounds, it sounds like you're, you're doing it exactly how someone should do it. And a lot of people don't look at it that way. And I think you're, you know, you're coming in at looking at it from an analytical background, from, from an engineering standpoint, I, I, as you were talking, I kind of, uh, you know, you're pulling a little bit on my heartstrings too, because I can relate to a lot of the things you were saying. So my family, I was on food stamps too, when we first came to the country. I, I'm a first generation immigrant, uh, came from Belarus, one of the former Soviet Union republics. And yeah. recently in the news being next to Russia and Ukraine with the war and everything else, we came here, it's been however many years now, almost 28 years since I came, I was 12 years old, but we came first generation immigrants, didn't have any connections here, no money, nothing. You know, we, we came here and 
went on food stamps because my parents couldn't even hold a job until they yeah. learned to learn enough English in order to be able to be productive and be able to, you know, perform for someone else. So I didn't speak English. They didn't speak English. And I think a lot of people who go through those types of adversities early on in life, you know, they, they have an understanding of what it's like to not have things. Yeah. And then if they have the, you know, the right mentorship or the right head on their shoulders and the right you know, surroundings for them, they, they can channel it into the, you know, business entrepreneurship and become very successful. So, you know, I, I can definitely relate and, that, and that's, you know, it's definitely an interesting part of your story. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. So the, the question I wanted to ask you then, so when you were, when you're talking about hiring friends and, and some family and everything, like, so did it, at one point, did it grow big enough where, you, you know, you actually started doing some like hiring through HR and actually bringing in, like how, how big are your businesses now at this point? Yeah, our our the one brokerage is the biggest one. I think we're up to 130, 140 people, wow. something like that. Wow. Um, that's admin processors, loan officers, mm -hmm. you know, virtual assistants, everything combined. Obviously, myself and David being two of those, right? Um, right. So, I mean, you know, I wouldn't say massive company, but we're bigger than yeah. your local small business, right? Um, but you know, we we started with what three people, <laughs> you know, yep. it wasn't something like oh, we just you know, we we were fortunate in the in the way that you know, when, you know, I guess it kind of helps to add some context to this because it wasn't just something that, you know, started and then it, it just became huge. We were very lucky in that obviously being associated with David, being associated with Bigger Pockets, we had a bit of a platform, right? But the side of that that a lot of people don't see is that the platform can be detrimental to your growth as well. Because if there's a level of commitment a level of responsiveness, a level of financial understanding, a level of knowledge and guidance and ability that comes with like the number one listen to podcast and in, in real estate podcast in America. Like you better be good, right? You better be really good if like these guys are putting their names on you, right? So it was something where literally once David and I partnered, it was it was almost like the perfect fusion because like I had the knowledge I had like the people building, you know, experience. Like I, I, I knew how to invest in people and motivate people. I just didn't have a platform, right? So taking David, who doesn't have the time to go build a business. I mean, and David does build businesses, but doesn't have a time to go like, you know, recruit people, right? right? And like go through interviews and like build people's knowledge of the mortgage industry up. We, it was almost like literally like two puzzle pieces. You know, it's that big long bar that in Tetris that just slides into the perfect spot, right? It's like a perfect right. match. Right. Um. And, you know, after after working with each other for three to four months, I think we both immediately agreed like, oh, we we're not going to find a better opportunity than this. Right. Like, let's do it. Let's, you know, all guns, all guns blazing, you know. Um, and obviously it's it's worked out. You know, we're still very much a work in progress. We are not a perfect company. We are not, you know, something that's that's set it and forget it now. Um you know, and that's that's the same with my investing journey. You know, none of my properties are set them and forget them, right? I'm very involved. I I want to know what's going on. I want to know what's going on with my loan officers, and my insurance agents, and my people. Um, you know, if anybody ever applies to work at my company, you'll you'll get a little taste of how active I am. I mean, I right. I still hand interview every single person who reaches out to us, right? Um, I think there's a right way to do things, and maybe at some point, that's going to be something that I can no longer control. But for the time being, I, I think that's that's why we've grown. And been as successful as we have been is because we built on some of the strongest foundational aspects that we could. Yeah, makes sense. How did you meet David? Were you working as an agent in his brokerage initially? Is that is that how? No, it yeah, it's a great that? question. Funny story, actually. When David first called me, I didn't know who he was. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't super familiar with Bigger Pockets. Um, I was a realtor and a, and a loan officer, um, and I had somebody pre-approved who he was the realtor for. And he just called me and he's like, hey, um, you know, I'm so-and-so's, I'm not going to name drop her, but, uh, you know, I'm so-and-so's agent. Um, she tells me you're her lender and she tells me that you're good. I'm like, oh, I appreciate that. I look forward to working with you. You know, and he was like, hey, do you, I'm, I'm David Green. I'm like, cool, David Green. I'm Christian. How you doing? <laughs> you know, I had no idea. Um, you know, and funny enough, obviously, I found out that he's the host of Big Pockets and then I checked it out and then I started listening to it. But that was probably three or four years before we started working together that we didn't really talk a whole lot after that. Right. We were kind of, you know, we ended up hearing each other's names every now and then. Um, but then when David was searching for a broker to partner with and loans, um, my name got thrown into the ring. Right. And he had tried and, you know, a couple of people couldn't deal with the volume or the building up people or whatever. Um, you know, and that mutual client of ours, who's a personal friend of his reached back out and said, Hey, why don't you give Christian a shot? Um, and that was kind of, the end of the road, right? The moment we gave it a shot, we realized very quickly that it would work. Um, 
So it's just funny enough, just talking to enough people that, you know, you find yourself in the right room with the right people every now and then, you know? Absolutely. So how do you guys divide the roles between the two of you? And I prefer before you answer that question, so again, I'm prefacing it too, because I, I own some businesses all with business partners sure. and we will really one main business partner. And I think that it, the most important thing, this is from my perspective for par par partnership that will work well is for the two people. If there are two of you to complement each other. So yeah. things that I do really well, he may not necessarily be that great at and things that I hate doing or I'm not that good at doing, or he, you know, he's way more effective at than me. Yeah. Is that similar for the two of you or are there are other dynamics involved? Very similar. Um, very similar. Obviously, David being the the head and the the you know the the face and the recognition that he is, um, that's obviously a huge benefit. Obviously, he's kind of like our our uh, our, our outward facing representative, if you would. Right. I'm getting a little bit more into that now with podcasts, and you know I host Bigger Pockets uh, Mortgage Mondays now. You know on the YouTube channel, so a little bit more of like the you know co branded effort now. Um, but you know, I'm I'm in the weeds. I'm I'm the COO if you want to put a role on it, right? I'm the operations manager. I'm you know making sure that nothing's falling apart internally. You know, I'm hiring. I'm making sure that you know our we're we're a brokerage, so we got to make sure we have strong lending partners. You know, I got to make sure my lenders aren't going to go bankrupt and we can't offer loans anymore, right? So kind of keeping a finger on the pulse of just kind of the internal workings. Um, you know, not David's role, right? Get out there, talk about us. You know, provide a service to people and and add value to the people listening. Um, and you know, don't worry about what's going on internally. Right. I got you. I'm, I'm like the, the moat that we've set up that nothing gets up there. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely say different strengths. Um, uh, but what we're both good at, we're both very good at. And, and I think they complement each other very well. That's great. So what about time management? Obviously, being a business owner with so many businesses, and I'll talk to you a little bit in a little bit about a, a few of your rental properties and what you're doing with those. I think that's sure. really interesting too. But how are you managing your time in being able to be involved in so many things? And it sounds like you're pretty hands-on involved with it. Yeah, I understand. This is a great question. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer it in a way that I think people may not be ready to hear. Or they may never think about. Um, I do so much because I feel like I actually save time, and I'll explain what I do when I what I say when I mean that. Um, I'll use the example of when I first started in the industry, right? A lot of realtors who are currently being realtors, it would be a lot of time that you have to input to also be a lender, right? And it would be more time that you have to input to be an insurance agent. Well, I thought of it as, wait, so this means I get to spend three minutes with every person that I'm spending one minute with because I'm spending a minute with them as a realtor, a minute with them as a lender, and a minute with them as an insurance advisor. So I'm actually saving time doing this because instead of, having a minute with me as your realtor and then go have a minute with John as your lender from Quicken Loans and then have a minute with Steve from State Farm. Like what if we just do all three of those meetings in this one minute? So I thought of that as not only can I provide a better service, but I'm actually saving like an incredible amount of time, right? Now that I've bought short-term rentals, I'm saving them, you know, maybe they're trying to get consultation into what market to target for short-term rentals. Well, I'm still your lender, right? In the background, I can still just have your financing talk with you. But now we're also talking about, you know, game planning, a, a plan of act, a plan of action, right, to actually acquire a property. Um, and I realized in consolidating those meetings, it, it kind of built up. You know, I, I had one of my one of my very first clients after I expanded to offering these three services. Um, you know, they were shopping me and they said, oh, this realtor will cut their compensation. This lender's interest rates cheaper. Like, fair. That's totally understandable. But just sit down and have a conversation with me. OK, they did that. We went to a coffee shop. Um, Chris and Rudy, I'll shout them out because they actually are part of my brokerage now. Um, but uh, that may be foreshadowing. The deal worked. Um, but you know, they sat down with me, and in, in a 30-minute conversation, we talked about running comparables for properties, how to target and make sure we're maximizing the offers that we put out there, how to target and maximize the offers in terms of acceptance rates, so not offering on properties that have 70 offers on them. Let's go get the ones that we actually have a competitive edge on. We talked about interest rates, and we actually pre-locked their interest rate before they started shopping. And we talked about insurance policy, so we got them an accurate quote so they could actually run numbers effectively once they got there. And then they went and talked to the agent from Remax. <laughs> well, you guys tell me, is it compare if it if it's a good comparative, you know, if you can actually compare this and they they match up, cool. Like use the other service because it's cheaper. That's fine. But you can't buy a Lambo for the price of a Honda. Like, you know, these are a little bit different, right? I mean, the knowledge that you're getting with working with me is saving mm -hmm. you four or five different conversations with other people. And when you package it all together, I'm actually cheaper. 
right? Because I can save them money on some insurance or it's yeah. like get a cheaper rate on the loan or we can work out commission on real estate. But it it, it, it just made so much sense. So I'll, your first question was, you know, time management. That's how I did it when I first started. I just felt like I was saving time. Nowadays, it's all about delegation, right? So I have three personal assistants, right? Probably when we scheduled this, you were probably talking to Chelsea, I'm assuming. Right? I sure did. 100%, right? So I have people that monitor different aspects. I have a personal assistant dedicated just to the one brokerage, right? Um, I have kind of my personal assistant, who's Chelsea, who's amazing, uh, but, you know, manages my calendar, make sure I don't miss stuff, you know, make sure things that get on the to-do list actually get, you know, addressed. Um, if I didn't have that, I would have reached the point probably two years ago where I would have failed. I would have been underwater. It wouldn't have happened. Um, one brokerage would not exist anymore. We wouldn't have an insurance policy. I probably wouldn't have any houses, right? Because I realized, you know, I, I focus where I actually spend my time during the day is David and I have this this kind of uh, mantra, I guess you can call it, of spend your time on the highest income producing activity possible, mm -hmm. right? Everything else, it, the, the hard part is when you scale up, like those income producing activities could get pretty broad, mm -hmm. right? Like I could go do a episode every day for bigger pockets. I'm like, that's probably a pretty good high and best use of my time, but then the company will fall apart. Right. right? So I, I have to dedicate some time to defensive strategies as well. Like, Oh, I got to make sure my loan officers are still understanding how to advise people. And I got to make sure they understand this new product. I got to make sure the house that was just in hurricane Ian is okay. Right. So, but if you prioritize things, like when you wake up in the morning and you say, if I wanted to make the most money possible or defend my earnings as much as possible, where would I spend my time today? Everything that doesn't land on that first five to 10 items of your list, delegate. It's not important, right? And it probably means somebody else can help you accomplish it. Right. right? That's the only way I found. If somebody finds some better way, please let me know because it is difficult at times. Um, and, you know, some days are worse than others, obviously. Um, but help and support and delegation, once you reach a point where it's unavoidable, right, to take yeah. that route, yeah. absolutely vital. So I've started kind of following the same path recently, but it, it is a very hard thing to let go of a lot yeah. of things that you are doing personally. And the other part of this too, and I want you, I want to get your thoughts on this, is the hiring part where A, you want to find someone who's going to be really good. And that's a that's a process as as I know now, and I'm sure you've you've been through it so much. But what about yeah. trust? you know, safety security of your information, like the financial information or any other, you know, passwords, whatever the case might be when it comes to finding personal assistance, especially if they're going to be virtual. I don't know if Chelsea and your other assistants are virtual. She's or not. not. She's a mile down the road for me. She's not allowed okay. to be virtual. Okay. <laughs> so now, yeah. So like, did you, is, is it because you had a personal relationship? You knew this person already from before, or is this a pure, you know, responding to an ad and hiring decision? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, I did know Chelsea personally before. Um, so maybe I cheated a little bit there, right? But I'll still answer your question in ways that I hire other people in the company. Um, I believe very strongly, maybe maybe the most strongly believed item that I'll mention on this, this interview. Um, and everybody, you know, people say this, but nobody really acts it. When you hire people, it's a, it's a mutual process. I haven't hired anybody. We've hired each other, right? If somebody does not believe in the goal and the vision of their employer or their broker or their boss or their manager, insert whoever your one level higher than you are in your life is, right? If you can't get on the same page and be motivated by that person and believe in what that person's trying to accomplish, you're not at the right place. And they're probably not doing a good job in establishing the right place. I mean, I can tell you right off the bat, I mentioned it briefly, but I'll tell you when somebody applies to work here, we do four, four or five rounds of hiring a year mm -hmm. where we hire new loan officers, new processors. If you apply in between those times, you got to wait because my hiring process is like intense. It's two weeks, one-on-ones with me, not one-on-ones, but me instructing class. And I actually put anybody who starts with our company, I don't care if you've been a loan officer for 15 years. I don't care if you're fresh out of college and you just got your processing license or your loan officer license and you just want to process. doesn't matter. You go through a two week course handheld by me because I promise you, no matter how long you've been in the industry, you don't do it like I do. I have no problem saying that. Right. And I've had people who have been loan officers for 15 years who have taken my course and they're like, 
oh my God, I didn't know half of this stuff, right? Because I feel, unfortunately, the industry is, and this is real estate, lending, insurance, everything, vastly underwhelms in terms of in terms of education. It just does. Every that's why most realtors suck. Like, sorry, realtors out there, if you're listening to this, there's not very many of you that are good. I hope the ones listening to this are good. But if somebody immediately, when starting the company, says, "Hey, you got to set two weeks of your life aside for me," and you're not hired yet. There's no job offer. There's no anything. But this is going to be my opportunity to present to you the plan for this company, the root cause of my motivation, what I'm trying to accomplish, and in accepting a potential future position here, what you're really getting yourself into, right? Because you're you're jumping on a bullet train of something where the owner is, is full speed ahead, Captain, and literally nothing will stop us, right? If you believe in that and you want to be a part of that, cool, let's do it together. Right. But it's not for everybody because mm-hmm. expectations, high, you know, it's like everybody wants to be a Navy SEAL until you go into basic training. Mm-hmm. And now it's real hard. But Call of Duty and all the video games made it look so cool. It's not right. If there's a Navy SEAL listening to this, hopefully leave a comment in YouTube or whatever. Like it's not fun. <laughs> right. It was hard as hell to, to do it. Right. Same thing. I know you're a lawyer. I mean, the bar wasn't fun. Right. No, it wasn't hard as hell. Right. But if you're motivated and you're you're aligning your goals with the people around you. I mean, how easy, how much easier to study when you're in a, in a group where everybody's motivated, yeah. like versus hanging out with the, you know, I won't say the loser, but, you know, hanging out with the guy pulling you down. Right. 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 I mean, it's just if, if you're in a room with people that are just moving, you're going to move. Laws of inertia start to take over, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I have an inverted view of hiring. I think I think they have to believe in hiring me mm. before a job offer can even be, you know, sent. I, they, yeah. they have to believe in me. I love it. I love it, Christian. I think that's a, that's a very good way to approach it. I'm going to, I'm taking notes of mental notes over here as we're talking about it. I think, I think that is a great way to do it. Um, so let's, let's shift gears for a second. I, you know, I appreciate you telling me about the businesses and, and kind of the, that side of things. Let's talk about real estate investing. And you mentioned that you didn't buy your first rental property until just a few years ago. Uh, but if I can share your uh, bigger pockets profile, let, yeah, me, go for it. let me see if we can do that real quick. So, here you've listed quite a few of your short-term rentals that you've purchased. And I was perusing through it earlier. And I mean, some of these are stunning, number one. So that's the first thing. There are some really awesome you know, pictures. If you look through uh, Christian's uh, post, the pictures that he's posting on here. Now, these are all Airbnbs. So these are, I'm sure, somewhere are you know on Airbnb's uh, website right. and probably some other short-term rental sites. But uh, I mean, to buy a property like that, I think it's something that you could be proud of. In general, set aside anything about income. You know, obviously, you're doing this to to make money and to uh, build financial wealth. But just looking at these properties, all of these are across the country from you. You're in California. Yeah. These are in states. Some of them on you know the East Coast. You got Florida on here. So tell me a little bit about this. So like, why did you do short term rentals? not in California, somewhere else, as opposed to what a lot of other people do. And even the topic that we're going to talk in just a little bit about house hacking, where yeah. you're living in the property. You didn't want to do that. You kind of went this route. What, what was the thought process there? I kind of pseudo house hack. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. So my number one, I'll explain why, why I finally decided to buy, because I, I could have purchased property much sooner. I, I, I understand that. Um, and of course, hindsight 2020, I should have been buying property for my first closing check on a real estate deal, right? Um, but in all reality, in, in you know 2020 after COVID, when you know we started turning the money printer on, um, I just lost all confidence and faith in the dollar. So I said, okay, time to get in assets. This is the time right now. Um, rates were low, you know. So okay, let's go start racking them up. And I bought 15 properties in 12 months, um, and these are all you know 800 to 1.2 million dollar properties. Like it's very quick high value purchases very fast. Um, obviously I was fortunate to be able to purchase in that fashion because of the business success. Um, but still that's aggressive for anybody, right? I mean, that's a million dollars of purchasing a month, right? Um, the thought process behind it, you know, I, I, I went back and forth a lot. I went maybe, maybe large multifamily, maybe commercial, you know, maybe just single family, long-term rentals in the Midwest. Um, and, and I, I can go through why, I said no to each of those and yes to short-term rentals, or I can just tell you kind of the biggest thing. I, I built a motto of investing what I investing in what I believe in. 
is there ever going to be somebody who doesn't want to be in the mountains or on the beach? Probably not, right? Is there going to be ups and downs and seasonality aspects to it and people traveling less? Sure. But in terms of an asset, I thought back to when I was a kid. And who's the kid's parents that you, you know, kind of long, like long to be, right? I, I remember a friend of mine um, and, you know, his parents, stop me if it sounds familiar, had a lake house, had an oceanfront beach property, had a house in Tahoe in the mountains near the ski resort like that. Historically, in my mind, I always thought, oh, you're successful when you get a vacation home. <laughs> right that's like the pinnacle of like i made it i'm cool i'm gonna go snowboard later right have you been have you been talking to my mom i feel like i just had this conversation <laughs> a couple of weeks ago I, I don't know she's she's telling me hey vitaly you're so successful you don't but you don't own a lake house what's up with that and I'm, I, mom i don't know i don't know yeah no it's 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 funny but you know and then and then i started thinking hey like i you know i i didn't have like a great like family situation growing up. my dad was in prison he's passed away now and, you know, I like I didn't have anything inherited to me. Right. So I also started to think from the standpoint, hey, in the event that I have kids, which I don't. But in the event that I do. If I was in their shoes, what would be something really cool to inherit? You know, you want the two bed, one bath house in Kansas. Sure. I mean, obviously, you'd inherit a house that's still going to put you ahead in life. Or I can inherit like a beachfront Florida property. That sounds pretty cool. You know, and I, I started to get in this mindset of, OK, let's purchase higher value properties. And once I met kind of with my accounts and I learned about the short term, you know, tax benefit and all these things, it kind of just all came together for me. I'm like, not only in that moment in time, was it the highest grossing prop, you know, um, investment type, but I could also invest in something that I believed in that was cool that I'd be proud to pass on to my, you know, my future heirs, but it was also putting me in the most tax advantage position. I, how could I buy anything else? Right. Sure. Um, so, you know, I don't have to worry about squatters. I don't have to worry about, you know, you have to worry about people being rough on your property, but I can deal with right. that, right? Yeah. Um, and I targeted specifically why I targeted the properties that I did. I targeted properties that were a little too expensive for like, you know, a kid and his mm. three buddies to go and trash your house yeah. on the weekend, right? right. They're not going right. to be renting a place that's 900 bucks a night. They're just not, right? Right. Um, so I've been lucky in that fact that I think I projected that well and that, you know, I, you know, we've hosted like company retreats, right, at our house. Um, that's a very cool feeling where you can bring your company out and you're staying in a nine or 10 bedroom house in the Smoky Mountains. And you're like, hey, guys, like there's an indoor pool. There's a movie theater. There's a game room upstairs. You all want to go play pool? Like, yeah. and this is my house. Let's all enjoy it together. This is a benefit and a perk of working at my company and putting faith in me. Right. Yeah. So it kind of bled in really well with my mentality of my company as well. And I thought it was just the perfect fit. So, yeah. That's awesome. So, I, now the next question that comes to my mind as I'm looking at these, and again, let me just just put them on the screen here again. So, how so? How are you sort? How are you how are you finding these deals? So I mean, these look yeah. amazing, of course. Are you finding them on market on the MLS, networking with other agents in the area, or are you by somehow finding them off market? What what's the process for finding them? I I did a unique one here. Um, I created a buy box and I gave my realtors limited power of attorney to write offers on my behalf. This is wild. I don't recommend it. Um, I created a buy box in by observing the financing of it, observing insurance and taxes. I created a buy box for each of these markets and I gave it to my realtor. Um, and I said, you're not allowed to use air DNA. You're not allowed to use Rabu or, you know, all the projections. But if you bring me three comparables, that meet my buy box and are similar to this property, you can write an offer on my behalf. Um, and to purchase the 15, this is probably a third about of my portfolio. These houses, I'm, I actually need to upgrade my bigger mm. pockets account. Um, this is probably about a, the third of the houses that I own. Yeah. Um, but if they could bring me three comparables in the recent past um, that mat, met my numbers and met my amenities and um, I only purchased furnished rentals, so I don't want to furnish stuff. I don't want to do any mm. renovation. It's got to be turnkey. Um, I told them that they are allowed to write blind offers on my behalf. Um, and to purchase those 15 properties in the 12 months I did, I probably wrote 300 offers probably. Um, but I wasn't writing them. Once again, that was delegation where right, I right. created the income producing activity, which is the buy box and making sure my numbers fit. And then I didn't fall in love and allow my emotions to dictate my actions with the actual mm. targeting of properties. I let the realtors do their job. 
And imagine mm -hmm. if you're a realtor and you get a buyer from California that says you have blanket approval to write offers yeah. for me and I'll buy 20 of them if you put them in front of me, but they have to meet these numbers. Sure. A number of realtors made a fine living off me in you're you know, gonna 2020 really to 2020. Hard. Exactly, right? Absolutely. So now I'm getting a little bit better service as well, right? Yep. Um, so that that's that's just how mm. I did. I don't recommend that. Obviously, it's a little aggressive, but yeah, I was very motivated to get my money into assets when I heard that we're printing trillions of dollars, right? And I think if I understand correctly, at least one of these you're uh, David Green is is a business partner on. You're, yeah, you're David's on the on. the big orange one. It's actually on my bigger pockets page because somebody requested I put it on there. Um, gotcha. But the big orange one with the it's yeah it's it's in the Tennessee Smoky Mountains. That's actually where we hosted the retreat. Gotcha, gotcha. That's great. Yeah. So well, congratulations on that for sure. And those are, I mean, the you said it's like nine hundred dollars a night. I mean, obviously. I'm sure you have variations between different properties and different locations. Oh, yeah. What, what's kind of what's the cash flow versus what? Let me let me put this way. What's the ROI on the down payment after all expenses that you're putting in into each of these properties? What are you what are you looking at in terms of returns? Yeah, good question. Now I'm going to answer it in a way you probably don't like. I'm going to apologize up front. Um, I have never bought a property based on what my cash on cash return is. That's probably like nails on a chalkboard with, for bigger pockets followers. Um, the reason being. In my opinion, is that expenses on properties are never predictable. You can never predict when your roof's going to go out, or when there's going to be a storm, or when your hot water heater is going to overflow. And I know Bigger Pockets and all the calculators and everything have made their their name and stapled it twice on these calculators and projecting cash on cash returns. I simply picked a number that could encompass the absolute worst case scenario: a catastrophic storm a big septic issue, a massive insurance policy. And I said, as long as I gross that amount, I'm good. Um, and that to me was a 15 to 20%, what I call gross rental yield, mm -hmm. which is take the purchase price. If it's a million dollars, my minimum that I would buy it for, it has to rent for 150,000 a year. That's it. So not only now I gave my realtors power of attorney, I also gave them very easy metrics to meet, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, if you show me a million dollar property, you got to show me three comparables to it that rented for 150K a year. If so, I'll buy it, right? And that sounds so simple. You'd be shocked at how difficult it is. <laughs> um, there aren't very many that meet those numbers, especially when you consider I also want something furnished without renovation, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it worked. And the vast majority of my portfolio did meet those numbers. Um, had a couple that fell short, but they still fell within a tolerable threshold. Um, you know, and ultimately... It was, it was a buy box that I had confidence in because I'm in the industry of real estate lending and insurance. I would never advise somebody who's just a buyer to build their own buy box. This may sound weird because everybody, all the gurus and influencers tell you to go buy your own buy, you know, create your buy box. Don't do that. Talk to somebody who knows what they're doing and actually sees the numbers and then have them build your buy box. That's probably smarter, right? Um, you know, it's like if you got, you know, a one-on-one -on -one game planned with Michael Jordan you wouldn't just teach yourself how to dribble and how to shoot, right? How about you go get some lessons from like LeBron, <laughs> right? right. Um, that, that's that's what I'd say. Your your network is everything, especially when you're investing out of state. Right. That is one thing that I haven't done yet, and I haven't you know really put any uh, effort into yet. My business partner and I are talking about Florida, possibly buying some uh, short term rental space in Fort Lauderdale, perhaps because he likes that. Location has been there himself in person. Yeah. I've been there. Once. I have three there. Three of those on that page are in Fort Lauderdale. Do you? Okay. So, yeah. so are they? Are those standalone houses, or are they condos, or what? What type of? Yeah, I only do single family rentals. Um, I don't like HOAs because it's just one level of ordinance that you have to work around. Um, only do short term rentals. I the only thing that's a little bit of a of a uh, breaking of that rule is I do have a property with a guest house, so I actually rent it out multiple Airbnb listings when it's not booked for the whole thing. Um, but ultimately I think the more people you have going back and forth on the same property, the more risk tolerance you're accepting, right? That's why I never got into big multifamily. I just think I, I know the returns could be good. I know the tax benefits could be good. Um, it's hard enough to deal with one tenant, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's hard enough to upkeep 14 units, right? I mean, it's, 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 it just gets you, you. You start getting into a realm of where, you know, you're you're kind of running 
like a customer service business. Absolutely. Oh, the, the faucet's leaking. Oh, the light's out. Yep. Oh, the carpet's worn, right? Instead of like, hey, these people are going to be in your house for four days. And if they have like bad experience, have your cleaners and maintenance guys go fix it when they're gone. Right. It just, e- even though short-term rentals are historically known as being more labor intensive, mm-hmm. I kind of view them as being easier because I don't have to deal with a long-term tenant that just develops this certain expectation of the property. Like mm-hmm. I'm servicing people for four days and then they're gone. Mm-hmm. Sounds easier to me. <laughs> right? Yeah. It, well, as long as you don't get any bad reviews, right? Because obviously everything is, uh, you know, reviews and true, true. And there marketing. are ways to, you know, I have little like ways that, you know, we, we make sure people give good reviews, but yep. Um, yep. absolutely reviews on Airbnbs are, are, are the, they could be the Achilles heel if you're not getting good ones. Yeah. So obviously you're not managing these properties yourself. You're not to get on a plane from California, flying to Florida or Tennessee. No. So t- talk to me just for a minute or two about how are you managing them? How did you find the people to manage? And, you know, it, it was that difficult Did you have a hard time no. or was it pretty easy once you've built up the networks? You're going to realize a lot of the ways that I scaled and growed are very similar to each other. Um, for a number of my properties, I partner with people who believe in my goal, who wanted to add value back to me. Um, and I co-purchased with a number of people, um, and their offering to the partnership was to manage. Um, another one was, Hey, I I run a lending brokerage. You're a property management company. If there can be some sort of, uh, you know, co-branding here, something that we can do together. Do you believe in what I'm doing? If so, this can be very mutually beneficial to each other. You can manage my properties. You know, we can do your loans, right? So there, there's different ways. And obviously not everybody can use like just my recognition, right? So I realize that. But if you operate from the standpoint of I'm going to work with people who abide by my same morals and fundamentals of my investment journey, you're going to find yourself in the room with the right people, right? And I would have utmost confidence if I was never to visit one of my properties again, that each of my managers would be doing a fine job with them. But that's only because of that expectation that I said up front and the realization that, man, if I can just get enough of the right people around me, this stuff's easy. The people who really run into problems are the person who tries to do everything themselves. Yep. Very difficult. You're, you're starting off on a losing foot, right? Yep. If you're looking for a short-term rental, go buy the first one with your brother. Does your brother have more time than you? Okay, have him go travel to the property and furnish it. Or like have him go every three months and just do a little upkeep visit, right? Like do that. You're going to be in a better position. And even though you're splitting the proceeds, like it, 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 the chances of you succeeding are so much higher. You just get mm-hmm. a little bit of support, a little bit of help on somebody who believes in the same journey that you're trying to walk. Right. So would you recommend, let's say someone is looking to buy their first rental property, but they want to do it in Airbnb and they want to do it out of state. So one of these resort markets, right? Would you recommend someone to just, you know, maybe fly out there once, visit the place, build a relationship with a realtor and then go ahead and do it? Or are you saying that you really need a bigger, more in-depth anchor and connection there in that market, wherever you're buying? Just trying to understand exactly what the suggested strategy would be for someone who's looking to do what you did, or at least on a much smaller scale, let's say. I'd say first steps don't necessarily have to be visiting every market because that could start racking up the bills. And I know a lot of people can't just travel on a, you know, drop a dime wherever you want to go. Um, to start though, obviously getting your finances in order. Are you capable of buying a property? First question. You get past that. Cool. Second question. Don't just go find a realtor. Don't go to the Zillow and just click on the first realtor. Call a few. Hey, are you familiar with short-term rentals? Hey, do you know property managers? Hey, what do you think of this area? Are prices up or down? You know, and you actually start getting some data where I'm, I'm really big on not just like shotgunning and like, you know, going in with no experience, no knowledge, no anything. Like there are people who are paid and some paid very well to do this job, to target and acquire and finance and, and manage and insure properties. There are businesses built around these. Some of the largest businesses in this world are focused on the real estate industry, right? You think of Zillow, you think of Redfin, you think of Keller Williams, you think of Remax, Coldwell Banker, like they're the size they are for a reason, right? Leverage the knowledge of industry professionals. And if you really even want to take it a step further, book a consultation call, book a call with somebody who does this. You know, I know all these influencers and 
I hate to say it, but I do it. I mean, I offer consultation calls if you guys want to see what I do, how I targeted a market. I mean, I can teach you how I built my buy box and what my purchasing requirements are on a, you know, what has to be available in there. I call it my little golden triangle, right? It has to have three points that I focus on before I agree to buy a property in a specific market. Um, you know, cheat a little bit. You know, I, I call it a, what did I call it in my course? I called it um, the Burger King strategy. You know what Burger King did? Uh, they bought the real estate, right? They wasn't just about, about that, the burger. Yeah, but. so they, they all kind of go by, for, but their strategy and where they acquired and where they put their locations, they could spend millions of dollars analyzing the the health you know, preferences of people in this market and what the ethnicities are and what the diversity is. And all the, they could put all this millions of dollars or they could just go put one across the street from every McDonald's. <laughs> That's what they did. And literally, Burger King CEOs got together and said, McDonald's is already spending hundreds right. of millions of dollars on market research a year. Why don't we just go put a put one in every market that they're in? That's why very often you see a Burger King very close to every McDonald's. Right. <laughs> right? It's a shortcut for sure. Saved yeah. a bunch of money. So why yeah. don't you guys do, you know, David Green, me, Rob Solo, you, all these right. people are like, we're the McDonald's. We figured it out. Just like right. copy. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Christian, I love the strategy on that. And, and, you know, if people want, do want to take you up on it, uh, it's booking a consultation. We'll, we'll, uh, I'll put, uh, your contact information in sure. the description of this video and the comments and all that. And I'll men mention it at the end of the video, but right now let's transition to the main segment of the show. I do want to get into sure. a little bit of some of your expertise and knowledge with regard to financing a first house hack or maybe a next house hack if uh, viewers and, and listeners are interested in doing that. And we're going to do that in the segment I call In the Lab. All right, guys. So I'm here with Christian Batchelder. We're talking about house hack financing. Christian, among other things, is an owner of a mortgage brokerage, and he has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to house hacking. So Christian, I just want to ask you maybe to start with, if you could give some examples of what types of loans someone could be qualified for if they're looking to buy a primary residence, which will also serve as a rental property for them. Sure. Um, there's multiple ways to go about it. The biggest discerning factor to start is what type of asset it is, right? So you could technically house hack anything. You could house hack a condo and rent out the other bedrooms in it, right? You could house hack a single family that has a garage conversion, an ADU is what we call it, right? Um, ADU stands for accessory dwelling unit, if somebody's not familiar with that termage. Um, you can house hack a multifamily. That's a two, three, or four unit property, right? There's all these different ways you can do it. What it ultimately comes down to, though, is the most, if you were to separate lending in three different brackets, the first one is your conforming bracket, okay? That's where you have to qualify with debt to income. That's where FICO score really matters. That's where down payments are low. This is the biggest part of house hacking. If you can keep that down payment low, that's where you should start because it allows you to scale and really have greater access to purchasing power based on the limited money that typically first time home buyers have, you know, typically first time home buyers isn't putting 20, 30, 40, 50% down. That's like what experienced people do who build up that capital, right? That brings me to the point, obviously the best one to use is an FHA loan. As I'm, as I'm sure people are familiar, you can put three and a half percent down on an FHA loan. That's for a one to a four unit property. Okay. Um, when you get into three and four units in high value markets, there's a couple lending criteria that are difficult to overcome. So what I tell people is that if you're in in between the East Coast and the West Coast, try to target a triplex or a fourplex. If you're on the borders, try to target a duplex or a single family with an ADU. It's going to be the best asset class you can buy. And the idea is if – let's do something in California. Let's say you buy a duplex, okay? Two-bed, one-bath, two-bed, one-bath, okay? That – you occupy with your family, two bed, one bath. If you're a single college guy, right? Or you're single, just, you know, recent grad, have a roommate in that second bedroom in your unit, right? That'll help offset your mortgage. You rent out a room for a thousand bucks in LA all day long. The other unit, two bed, one bath that can house a family is probably getting 25 to $3,000 a month, depending on where it is. Your mortgage on that is probably going to be six, seven grand, but you got three grand and a thousand, four grand. You're now living for three in a house that costs you seven grand. So a lot of people say, oh, no, house hacks doesn't work because I can't offset the entirety of my mortgage. You're losing the point a little bit here. Yeah. 
yeah. you're building wealth at a seven thousand dollar a month rate, yeah. only expensing three thousand. And what you're not realizing is when you move out, now you have three thousand, three thousand. Now you're just about breaking even. You have a rental property that somebody else is paying your mortgage, and you get all the tax benefits, and it doesn't cost you anything. That's a win, right? You're also not realizing that those tenants are paying down that mortgage. Right. So you only put three and a half percent down. Let's put some numbers on this. You buy a million dollar house. Seems like so much. That sounds like such a big number to a first time home buyer. Oh my God, how can you buy a million dollar house? Well, because I put $35,000 down. That's like the cost of a Honda. <laughs> so instead of going and buying your Honda in cash, Go buy a million dollar house. That seems pretty crazy, doesn't it? And get some rental income to offset it. Once you move out, you offset all of it. You build up that equity. You do it again next year, right? And the idea is as long as you can qualify in this first bracket of lending, which is like full doc is what we call it. It's where you have to qualify with your tax returns and your actual income verification. Those are the loans that seasoned investors can't compete with. Like I can't do that anymore. I have more right. than 10 properties. You can't right. do that anymore. There's no more conventional loans for us. Right. So everybody who thinks like, oh, there's all this competition and all that, like you're only competing with other conventional loan buyers, right? right. If you're getting this really strong, solid product. Right. The investors like I don't get the benefit of the doubt anymore. I got to go pay the non-conventional interest rates. Right. It always cracks yep. me up when people complain about like an FHA interest rate. I'm like, right. I'm paying like three percent more. Yeah. <laughs> right. You, and I have to put 20 percent down. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So if you have access to that, if you're a veteran, please, for the love of God, use your VA loan. It's the best loan in the country. Zero percent down, lowest interest rates, no PMI. It's insane. Yep. Um, but utilize those low down payments, something that you can note. Oh, I don't qualify for a million dollar house. Cool. Get a co-signer. One of those people that was going to occupy the property with you, get them on the loan. Oh, we still don't qualify. Cool. I can add up to four people to a mortgage. Now I'm not saying go just like maximum leverage every one of your friends, right. Right. but get in the right one, the right people. I promise you there's somebody in that re local real estate investment meetup group who's trying to house hack as well. You right. guys may be able to, you know, lower the barrier to entry if you just do it together. <laughs> right. Right. That would be my starting point for sure. Yeah. So, okay. So you mentioned FHA, three and a half percent down. Yep. You mentioned VA for veterans, zero percent down. What about if you wanted to do, you know, there's a conventional route, right? So mm -hmm. what what's the down payment on just a conventional owner occupied loan? Conventional with a single family, you can put three to five percent down. The problem is when you start getting into multifamilies with conventional. This is where FHA and VA really separate themselves. Mm -hmm. The down payment goes up to 15% for a duplex and 20% for a three to four unit, which kind of invalidates right. most first time home buyers. The point. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so stay FHA if you're two to four or VA. Conventional, if you want to target like a single family with an ADU, that's still a single family. So you can put 5% down. Right. Um, you just want to stay away from the multifamilies when you're going conventional. Gotcha. So, so let's say, let's say you're trying to buy, let's say you're in the middle somewhere, like you said, not on the, not on the East coast, not on the West coast. I, I happen to be, I guess you can consider my area investment area East coast, but we're not really because we're not New York city. We're two, two and a half hours removed from New York city. So yeah. we're more inland and we are more like those Midwest markets than we are the coastal sure. markets. So like for us, and obviously this matters too, obviously, and you mentioned it already, but Different cities, different markets have different inventory available. So you might be in a city or in a town where it's almost impossible to find a fourplex or a triplex because they just didn't build those around there. Maybe there's an abundance of two families and an abundance of single families, but none of the other slightly larger multi-units yeah. or vice versa. Like in my area, I'm I'm very fortunate. I feel like because not only do we have, the, so I'm near, I'm near Albany, New York center it's the it's the capital of new york state which not new york city a lot of people <laughs> have <laughs> yeah, that misconception. You would think, uh, just like just like california right it's not it's not la right it's not la uh, not san francisco uh, so so we are at the capital so we have a lot of jobs coming from government government and agencies businesses as well and we have quite a few colleges so we have a very strong uh renter pool right and we also have some of the kind of like it's like a multiple city area that are 
sprawled out, but pretty close to each other, where they did years ago when they were building these cities, when they were building them up, they have an abundance of small multifamily properties. So I'm kind of like in this best of all worlds type of a yeah, situation where too bad. the prices aren't crazy high. So we're not talking about a million dollars for a duplex. We're not talking about a, you know, even a million dollars for a fourplex. We're, we're more, especially if you're looking in the kind of the blue collar neighborhoods, I'm like in the 250 to 350 range between for triplexes to fourplexes and so forth. And if everybody in that city should be getting a three and a half percent down fourplex loan every year. (laughs) Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, so if that's your market and that's what you kind of, that that's the area, that's what you have available to you. Definitely take advantage of it. If you're in one of these other markets that Christian is talking about where it has to be a single family or, you know, ADUs are extremely popular and, and they're actually encouraged in California, as I understand yeah, it. They sure Go for are. that, you know, do that. But one thing that I kind of want to ask you about then, given that perspective and that advice. So what if someone wanted to do this several years in a row, right? So can they, is it possible to build a small multifamily portfolio, not anything crazy, not 100 units, not 150 units or anything like that. But, you know, what's the limit of this? Can they do this three, four, five years in a row? Or is there is there really an upward limit on it? Yeah, good question. And the answer is that they can. Most lenders will tell you that they can't. Um, when you're hopscotching primaries, right, you're moving every year, as most people probably know, the limit for a single fam, I mean, for a owner occupied properties, you have to live in the property for 12 months, right? After that, you can move out and use it as a rental. You don't have to refinance it. You just have to occupy it for 12 months. So the question becomes, can I do this every 12 months? Yes. With a couple caveats. Number one, you have to continue being able to qualify. So as you pick up more mortgages, it becomes harder and harder to qualify. Now there are rules of using the rental income that your perspective to, to get now, right? Um, that you're anticipating from a new tenant. There's some rules with how much of that you can use. Um, There's a rule for how far you need to move away from the house. Ultimately, the biggest rule is as you move from house to house, is there a substantial upgrade? This is the thing that nobody ever talks about. Yep. For instance, right? you have somebody who, let me use my California example. If anybody's listening from Los Angeles, you have somebody living in Malibu in a $2 million house. Beautiful house, view of the ocean, it's awesome. View of the ocean would probably be 15 million in Malibu, but whatever, 2 million for our for our example. Okay. They want to go get pre qualified to buy a five hundred thousand dollar duplex in uh Bakersfield. It's like a two and a half hour drive. You can't commute to work, but it's gonna be my primary. I listen to bigger pockets and I'm gonna house hack. No lender is gonna buy it, right? You live in a beautiful two million dollar mansion in Malibu, you're not gonna go share walls with a tenant in Bakersfield. It's just not gonna happen. Right. So flip that around now. If you start in the duplex in Bakersfield, and then maybe you move into a triplex in Riverside, and then maybe you upgrade into a single family in, I don't know, I'm trying to get closer and closer to LA here, um, in Orange County, and then maybe you end in the $2 million home in Malibu. Every single one of those moves had a substantial upgrade. What's a substantial upgrade? Yes, it's either square footage or typically purchase price. Or if you can make some real strong case that the backyard or the school district is like fantastic, maybe you'd have an argument there. But what they don't want to see is a decrease in asset type, meaning going from an ocean view multi-million dollar house to a $500,000 duplex. They don't want to see a decrease in square footage and they definitely don't want to see a decrease in sales price. Okay, so just start at the lowest end of your perspective portfolio that you're trying to build and slowly scale up. People make the big mistake. Like I'm trying to go get the biggest, largest, yep. best cash producing fourplex right off the top. Yep. And then they try to go downgrade into a smaller triplex because that's all they can afford. It's like, well, they're not going to believe that you made that move. Right. right? So can be tricky, biggest- but that's something that really, really needs to be emphasized because that's nothing that anybody talks about. Right. I've watched numerous videos numerous podcast episodes. I've, you know, followed a lot of people on bigger pockets, off bigger pockets on YouTube. And almost never has this been mentioned. You know what I mean? So I feel like it's definitely something that should Because none of them have a mortgage broker's license. Right. Right. But but even people (laughs) that have done it, 
it, you know, supposedly have done it multiple times. Yeah. They could have brought that up, but they really hadn't, you know? So I've, I've watched some videos where people were talking about, I did it four times. I did it three times. And I'm sure this went into the calculus. I'm sure this was part of the equation of how they were able to do it. And maybe yeah. it was, you know, maybe it was three single family ha homes that they house hacked where they did it by room. And maybe they slowly grew the portfolio or maybe they had, you know, part of it was a move where, you know, they had to move for a job or whatever. It was the other justifications where it could uh, qualify for the underwriting standards. But it's definitely something that if people are looking at this strategically, and I'm a I'm a huge proponent of house hacking. Anyone who's watched my YouTube oh, yeah. videos and my podcast. By far the like, best way to get into real estate. The best 100%. way to get started. Right. So, but if you guys are going to do it, if you're thinking about doing it and getting into it, be strategic about it. Yeah. Watch, really learn and watch YouTube videos like this. Talk to people in the industry, such as yourself, who are, the financing is going to be the, almost the number one thing. I, I feel like yeah. you, you'll be able to find a rental property that can serve as a house hack pretty much in any market. It's a matter of, can you scale it after you do that? If you bought it wrong, you can't. If you didn't talk to the right people, you can't. So you got to really do the legwork ahead of time if that's your plan. Now, if, if you're just starting out and you want to learn how to be a landlord and you want to get into house hacking, you want to buy one, start with a house hack, and then you branch off into another strategy like myself, you know, Burr strategy, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat, using private money or whatever, by all means, that's totally fine. But if you're not trying to be a mogul and if you're not trying to, maybe not even trying to quit your day job, maybe you want to keep your W-2, but have a nice little uh, nest egg of a rental portfolio on the side that will grow your wealth over the next 20 to 30 years. And you know, you're going to be a multimillionaire by the time it's all said and done. And it doesn't take a ton of, of your time to manage it and you keep your day job because you love it then that's, that's the way you want to do it. You don't want to willy-nilly buy the first rental property that your local agent wanted to sell to you who doesn't own any rental properties themselves. And you talk to you know whoever, Bank of America, uh, about how to finance and you didn't talk to someone like Christian. That's a big mistake. Would you agree? Yeah. I can't tell you how many times somebody's come to us and says, you know, oh, in your example, B of A says we can do it. And we say, okay, go try. And they call us on day 14 of escrow. We couldn't do it. Can you save the deal? No, I told you we couldn't do it up front. <laughs> like the, the best way you can tell if somebody's good at their job, this is going to kind of be a hot take maybe. Um, but in, in a sales-oriented job, real estate, lending, insurance, those are my three. This could be car sales. This could be anything. Is if somebody tells you you can't or shouldn't do something that leads mm -hmm. to them making money, that's a level of honesty that is very hard Absolutely. for a salesperson to obtain. Because yep. if a realtor is telling you that you're not ready to buy a house and the realtor's next paycheck is dependent on you buying a house, mm -hmm. that's probably really good advice if the person who's making money off of you tells you you're not ready yet, <laughs> right? Or tells you this strategy is not accomplishable or tells you don't do it this way, right? Mm -hmm. And their whole service is to provide that, right? Probably a sign of a good lender. The guys who can say, we'll do anything. We're the best at everything. And I tell people all the time, we're not going to be the best lender for every project. It's no problem. That's okay. Right. I'll be honest with you if you call me, you know, but yep. it's the people who say, yeah, you can buy one house a year and there's no, there's no obstacles. Please don't listen to them. There are obstacles. It is capable and possible to do with the right guidance. I hate to just keep using that as a cop out, but that's when I'm hiring people, when I'm looking for people, when I'm advising people, everything is just like, get with the right people in the right room who you trust. Right. They'll advise you right. You'll succeed more. I promise. <laughs> right. Agreed. So now one thing that one question I'm sure will come up in some people's minds is, okay, so Christian is saying, try to use an FHA loan. If you can buy a, a larger multifamily, meaning number of units, and then go downwards from there and obviously buy something that's smaller square footage and then go upwards from there with that. What about having multiple FHA loans? There's a restriction on that too, right? There is. Yeah. You're supposed to refinance out of an FHA loan before you get a new one. Um, there's a very small exception on if you get relocated for work, you can technically hold to it one time. Um, I don't even want to say that, though. The requirements of that are so few and far between that you rarely see it. Um, but you are supposed to refinance that FHA into a conventional, which means you got to have the equity to do it. Right. Right. Once again, something that not a lot of people say. Um, is it possible to buy one FHA house a year? Yes. Would it put you in a better position to be able to do it if you're in a really highly appreciating time in the market? It's not a surprise. You heard all the people buying one house a year. What? I think it was really popular 
probably the last like three years, 2019 to 2022, when like record appreciation was happening, everybody had 20% equity after one year. And probably also like after the great financial crash, right? Like 2010 through like 2015, when property values were also rebounding from 2008, right? Um, It's not a secret that when the market does well, all of a sudden there's gurus everywhere, right? What you should pay attention to is the people who are talking even when the market sucks, right? The people who are still advising, who are still operating a successful business, who are still buying property when the market sucks, when rates are high and prices are high. You don't hear a whole lot of gurus coming out and talking right now. You hear like, you know, Pace more be finding creative ways to sell or finance stuff, but like who else really, you know, it's like bigger pockets, like David and I, you know, not to just say us, but like it's the people who short term strong markets by strong markets. I mean like record appreciation year after year is going to make everybody look brilliant. You could buy the worst house on the block and you'll have 20% equity in a year. That's not good investing, (laughs) right? You got real lucky. So I would add too, like you're saying, appreciation that maybe is happening organically, you get lucky. That's that's great. Good for you, right? You got lucky. You can refinance it. That's awesome. We're not necessarily going to expect that currently with the current economic conditions. Like you said, this was a case in several markets across the country over the last couple of years. May not necessarily be the case going forward uh, for the foreseeable future. With that said, you know, there is an opportunity depending on how you buy your property, right? And depending on what you could possibly do to it to maybe add improvements, do something to it in the meantime while you're living there that could possibly push your equity, force your equity up and possibly allow you to refinance or maybe maybe you would do a refinance and then add a little bit of cash that you've saved up because you ha- didn't have to pay for a living expense because your tenants were paying for it during that time. Yeah, you can still get out of that FHA loan and can still then afford using an FHA loan to buy the next property. So I yeah. think there's still ways to do it. You may have to get a little bit more creative. And like Really strong Christian combining said, Burr and house hacking, like you just exactly. said. Exactly. Yeah. That's what you I'm start saying. start combining exactly. these strategies hundred percent. Right. So, Again, that takes a little bit more strategic planning. You probably are going to want to be dealing with people who have done this before in your market or at least know the right people and and know the strategy, but it's definitely possible and you can still do it and you can still do it for a fairly low upfront investment. So, which is why I'm still very, very supportive of this type of a strategy to start with for many reasons, but this is, this is one of those reasons. Yeah. hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's by far and away the best way to get into real estate investing and subsidizing your living expense while you build up savings to, to invest further. Awesome. All right, Christian. So let's shift our gears to uh, one of the last few segments here. We're going to go through them real quick. I have a, a segment I call overrated underrated where I ask my guest, I mention a topic or I mention a, put a statement out there and say, okay, what is your opinion on this? Do you think this is underrated, overrated, or in some cases people view it correctly and maybe you would say it's, it's rated just right. So let's do that right now. All right, Christian. So the question I want to ask you in this segment is, do you think that finding an investor minded mortgage broker one who maybe is an investor themselves already is overrated, underrated, or rated just right by investors out there. I think I've made my stance pretty clear. It is vastly underrated. People shop for interest rates. People shop for, you know, whatever it is, but you don't shop for a person very often, right? If you're getting advice and guidance from someone like myself or David or watching this show or wherever you're at, you're, you're, you're going to be more successful than saving an eighth percent on your interest rate from Quicken loans could ever get you. Right? So I think your point is too, is that it's not about the, it's not about getting the lowest interest rate or the saving your money on, you know, whatever fees are charged up front. If you're doing this as an investment, if that's what your goal is and you're trying to you know, find the right partnership and, and possibly do more deals together, possibly, you know, obtain the financing that will get you to the point where you want to go. I agree that I think that the right move is not to look at the the short-term savings by saving some of the costs, some of the expenses, but rather go with a person who knows the market in and out, who knows the industry yeah. in and out and get the right advice from those people. 100%. And I think the same thing applies too with real estate agents. I know you mentioned you're a real estate agent. You help your clients locally. I own a real estate brokerage in my local area. 
all of our investors or all of our agents on the team are investors themselves. Yeah. Almost all of them. They're either into flipping, they're buying their own rental properties. So we service people who are primarily investors. Either, yeah. either they want to do flipping or they want to get into rental properties. But there are so many other agents in the area that, you know, are doing single family residential and buyers go to them sometimes because, hey, you know, maybe they're offering a discount or maybe they, you know, they saw them on a billboard somewhere and that's who they gravitate toward. And I would say, I would argue along the same lines as what you were saying that that's not the best way to go. Yeah. You're going to save and make a lot more money if you're going with the person who knows how to get you the right deal. If you're a seller on the flip side of it, you're paying a, you know, a discounted commission to a discount brokerage. That's not the smartest move to make when it comes to finding the right professional who can help you if you're trying to achieve a certain goal and not just trying to go for the, for the shortest reward up front and paying the least. Would you agree? A hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. All right, Christian, let's skip to the next segment then. This one I call In the News, where I'm going to ask you or bring up a topic that's been in the news for a while, and we're going to talk about it briefly and give our uh, listeners and viewers our opinions on it. So the In the News topic for this podcast for me is the fact that we've had interest rates and interest rates going up being in the news for what? It seems like, I don't even know now, six, seven, eight months. Long now going on. <laughs> yeah. Going all the way back to last year, pretty much around this, this time. And this is a topic that's been talked about a lot on podcasts and YouTube shows, but I kind of want to take your, your thoughts on it because again, you're a mortgage lender, you're a mortgage brokerage owner. What are you seeing now? Number one, where do you think this is going to go? Are they going to hold steady? We're right now. I think Forbes recently posted an article saying that the average residential rate is something like six point four six or six point six percent. Where do you think they're going to go? Question number one. And number two, when it comes to investors and also hybrid investors, house hackers, is this something that they should be concerned about? Should they be waiting for the interest rates to drop? Or should they just go ahead and, and look at the fundamentals of the properties that they're looking at and go ahead and buy? What's your, what's your take on that? I don't want to fall into the category of the lender who tells people that it's always a good time to buy. Because I understand there's a lot of people who say that with the wrong intentions, right? Because they have to make a commission. I get that. However, if we just look at the fundamentals of what our economy is right now, I don't think any of us believe that inflation is actually 4%. Fair. <laughs> um, there's, there's no way. Um, no. I don't think any of us believe that if rates dropped by one and a half percent, there wouldn't be an absolute craze and a rush to buy real estate. Because all these people who are pre-approved at 7% would now have access to five and a half percent rates. And now you qualify for 500,000. Now you qualify for 750. The What I can say, this is from industry insider, insider trading here, whatever. There is an astronomical amount of money waiting on the sidelines. I don't mm. know what better way to put that. Mm. Just us, we're in the grand scheme of things, a small brokerage, right? We don't compare to Chase. And I mean, we have a good amount of people and we do great volume for like, you know, a, an independent brokerage, right? Which we're not a bank. We're not a big credit union. We're not Chase or Wells Fargo or Bank of America. I and mean, we have over $2 billion in pre-approvals issued, right? Probably more than that now. That was of like four months ago. Um, and the amount of people who have sat there and waited and who have said, I'll buy when rates are five. I'll buy when rates are five and a half. I just don't see a scenario where if somebody's trying to time the market and wait for like their perfect entry point, oh, I'm just waiting for prices to drop by 10% or 15%. I can tell you guys that I don't think the rates matter. And that's a really weird take. I get it. It's weird to hear. There is such a bigger benefit to buying real estate for someone like myself. I mean, I, I can save $400,000 a year in taxes buying real estate. Right. I don't need a property to cash flow. I can cost seg and depreciate it and, and do everything else. And I can have a property to vacation in. I can have a location that I can go take my company to. I can Airbnb it when we're not there. And even if it breaks even or loses a little bit of money, like it's okay. And I don't want to like pitch myself as like this bad guy. Like I'm taking up all the housing because in the grand scheme of things, investors own I think like institutional investors made up like three or 4% of the buying pool last year, even though people make a big deal that BlackRock's buying everything. Right. 
But it's important to mention that not everybody buys for cash flow. And the only thing interest rates impact is cash flow. So yes, the, the house hackers who can't afford that mortgage payment. Yes, the investor that needs to cash flow 100 or 200 bucks a month to make this make sense. Yes, it impacts those people. But if those prices drop by 10%, I go buy it. Somebody like David goes and buys it. Somebody like you goes and buys it. Somebody like the savvy realtor who realizes we just printed trillions of dollars. There's no way this asset's going to go down. Mm -hmm. Especially when you consider if prices drop a little bit, interest rates are going to drop. And if interest rates drop, it's going to rebound the price immediately. I think what's a more likely scenario is that a dollar is just going to become – I was thinking about this the other day. You, you remember like in like the 90s? Like if somebody said they made six figures a year, right? It's like holy shit! Like you're right, really right. killing it. Oh my yeah. god! How did you do that? What are you a doctor? Like right. I remember growing up, I was like six figures. You make a hundred thousand right. dollars. Yeah. And now it's like you make one flip and you make a hundred. You know, it's like right. it's not sure. the same money it was. Yeah. I think that's the more likely scenario is that prices are just going to keep going up. We're just going to lose lose our childhood value of money, right? Whereas a, a house on the end of the block that's two and a half million dollars in 10 years, somebody's gonna be saying that's it. Right. Right. That's much more likely to me than rates impacting buying power. And your question was like, what do I see like the impact or maybe their direction they're going to have? Yeah. I, I, I don't think it's going to matter. That's, that's really my answer. And it's, it's such a weird thing to say, because how can interest rates not matter? I just think the, the, the desire of people to get their money into an asset overwhelms the impact that interest rates are having. I can tell you that we process, I mean, we're, we're processing hundreds of loans right now <laughs> and mm -hmm. we are a small brokerage. I mean, right. You know, it's, it's, I'm saying it from experience. I'm seeing these people still buying when rates and people are using non QM loans. Rates are eight to nine percent. People mm -hmm. are still, mm -hmm. you know? Right. All right, guys. Well, you heard it here. Don't sit on the sidelines and just wait for rates. If the deal makes sense, buy the deal. And Absolutely. worst case scenario, Christian, if, if rates go down two years from now significantly where it makes sense to refi, just go refi, right? I mean, right. what's the what's the harm? Yes, you'll pay a little bit more in closing costs. And and I know some cynics here in the comments might say, oh, of course, he's going to say that he's a mortgage broker. He's going to make money twice, whatever, whatever. But I think it's true regardless. And, and those people, by the way, I mean, that's a scarcity mindset. That's what you're 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 just trying to pinch pennies as opposed to looking at the upside okay, you know, do, do you, you know what I mean? The, if you yeah. want to do business that way, by all means, but, uh, I think the right way to do it is, is not to worry about things like that. You know, I bet you the people that bought in 2017, when everybody said the market's going to crash, who ended up refinancing in 2020 did. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. You know, yeah. At that time, everybody's saying the same thing. You can't refi yeah. later. What if the market crashes? Well, right. I'm going to go buy a house and we'll right. see how it works out. We, you know, go back buying, every three years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's now 2020. 2017, yep. 2015, 2012. Yep. It would have worked every single year. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's a in, real estate is a cycle, and you just have to look on buy on fundamentals, go from there, and yeah. eventually, rising tide lifts all of ships. So that's all yeah. you got to worry about. All right, Christian. Last segment of the show, real quick. Call it tip of the week. So the question I want to ask you on this segment is we were talking about house hacking. We were talking about financing for house hackers. What would your one advice be? Brand new investor who's possibly looking to house hack. What should they be looking to do in terms of getting ready to finance a property like that? What should they be doing? What steps should they take? Should they worry about their credit scores first and foremost, down payment and so on? Do you have any other suggestions for that? Yeah. Absolutely. I love it. Um, practice. This, this is a weird response. Um, I would say practice house hacking. Where are you living right now? Do you rent? Do you rent a two bedroom and there's only one of you or maybe a spouse and you guys use the other room for an office? House hack it, right? Put your desk in your bedroom, lose your office, get a tenant for your other one and sublease it. Make sure you check with your landlord and you know, do all the compliance. This is not legal advice, right? But practice if you can. You know, you got an extra room in your parents' house that you inherited from them. House hack it, right? See if you can do it. Even if you don't own a property yet, see how it works. See if you can deal with that, you know, discomfort. See if you can deal with that, having somebody share walls with you, right? Maybe start talking to your friends. Hey, if I buy a house, would you rent from me? You're paying Joe Schmo, some stranger, you know, 1200 bucks a month. 
would you pay it to me instead? Right. Have a conversation with your friend. We could also like, you know, hang out a little bit. Maybe I'll give you a hundred bucks off a month. I'll give you 1100. Like don't tear up my house. Yeah. You know, you may get a better tenant because of that. Right. Um, and ultimately uh, a strategy that I've seen a lot of people be successful with is simulate a mortgage payment. So what I mean by that is if you're renting right now for 2,500 bucks a month and your mortgage payment is going to be three grand, practice paying three grand for your rent. Now don't actually do that, but put 500 bucks into a savings. Don't spend it. Right. Pretend like it's gone. Can you live? If it starts to really put a strain on your marriage or your relationships or your kids or your, your commute life or your like, you know, flexibility money, like go see movies, go out to dinners, then you might not be ready. Maybe you need to get a second income, you know, a second income source, some side hustle, something. Go drive for Uber Eats on the weekend, something like that. Right. Um, but if you set that five hundred dollars aside and all you really realize is, oh, I'm just ordering delivery less and drinking a less Starbucks a week. Is that worth owning a home? Probably, <laughs> you know, if we're being honest. So just practice would be my answer. I love it. I've never heard that answer before. This is one of those moments where like, wow, this is this is something unique. I've never heard that before. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing Absolutely. that. Awesome. All right, Christian. Well, we've reached the end of the show. How can people find you? How can they get in touch with you, your contact? Absolutely. Obviously, the company is the1brokerage.com, um, all spelled out, T-H-E-O-N-E, brokerage.com. Um, my email is christian at the1brokerage.com, spelled like the uh, like the religion, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N. And you can also catch me on social medias as the one broker. I'm on Instagram, TikTok, all that stuff. If you want to see little reels about me giving presentations like this, um, the one broker with underscores in between the words um, is how you find me there as well. Um, and yeah, reach out if you want. Obviously, lending advice. Shoot me an email at the one brokerage. If you just want to follow me, you know, give me a, give me a like, give me a shout on social media, and I'd be very grateful for it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Christian. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining me. I hope you have a great rest of your night, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Awesome. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me.